Hi, a very warm welcome to the second edition of Teach Talks. Teach Talks is a thought leadership forum, which is dedicated to experts from the education industry across the globe. Very happy to share with our viewers that Teachment is an integrated school platform that caters to your end-to-end -end solutioning for all kinds of automation and school management requirements. Today, on this note, I have some esteemed speakers who are the change makers from the education industry with us. Without further ado, let me start with the introduction of our esteemed speakers. Calling upon Veronica Mordi. Veronica is currently working as Assistant Head of School Holden Park at Lagos. Veronica, over to you. I'm so glad to be here. I'm excited. I am really excited. So teaching for me has, it's, it's, for me, it's just my life. I love to teach. And particularly in the terrain where I work in Nigeria, Lagos, we know it's, it's really tough because we have children from different backgrounds, different cultures, you know, mindsets. Parents as well from different backgrounds, mindsets, way of living, the economy is there, the challenges with COVID and all. And we just see ourselves, you know, consistently making changes, improvements, just to be sure our kids are learning. Now, uh, particularly with the area of teaching and learning, Nigeria is learning to move away from the traditional method of teacher talk and children listen. Particularly with our background as Africans, we know that it's predominantly parents in charge and kids get to listen. But now we're learning that you have to listen to the children and get them involved. So the key word that's moving around Nigeria now is child-centeredness. How do you ensure learning is about the child? Uh, we're all learning to understand that we need to actually engage children a bit more beyond just packing and pumping them with content. You let them understand what you're teaching. Let them know where they're going to with their learning and tell them how they're going to get there. So it's a learning process for every single one of us. Technology has played a, a significant role with that. <laughs> for adults, we are exactly tech savvy. A lot of us are not. We are tech aliens. I think that's the word I'll use. And the children, they seem to be on board with learning, with technology. So adults are learning. And I think it's really getting better. Yes, our government is really doing much, mm -hmm. but some individuals are coming up to question the government, engage them and say, we need your involvement. Private system, private schools are doing a lot. We're well, just a significant number to the whole population. If we have that leadership pushing down, you know, giving us access to information or trainings, then it just makes everything whole. So that's where it is for us in Nigeria. So I'm really glad to be here. And I'm hoping to learn much more from what everyone is doing and how I can infuse that into my school. So thank you for having me. Awesome. Great. Veronica, I could hear and I, we all can sense the passion that you have about making a difference to the education. Uh, uh, would you like to just say a quick message to all your fans, your teachers, your colleagues, your students and parents? Anything for them? So what I'll say for the teachers, I hang in there. It's tough. We know covid economy, elections, but the reality, always remember the passion you have for the children to learn. That should be your driving force. The passion to just make a change, change their behavior, awesome. support them, prepare them for the future. When you remember that, then it makes it easier. When the challenges come, you can find a way around. So for the parents there, please bear with us. We're all in your house, in your space, you know, demand you partner with us and work with us. You know, it's not a pushback. We just need you to support us to educate our children. And for our children, kudos to all my children out there, my science <laughs> students, my math, French, and all. It's always lovely to have you around. Thank you, everybody. Great. Thanks, Veronica. That was lovely to hear about you. Very, very inspiring and motivating. Moving on to Jonna Carla Bean. Jonna, you are currently working as Director, Office of International Affairs, Polytechnic University at Philippines. Over to you. Please tell us a little bit more about yourself. Thank you very much, Prita. Good evening from the Philippines. Aside from being the director of the Office of International Affairs of the Polytechnic University of the Philippines, I am also an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology graduate and undergraduate programs in the same university. I would really agree with Veronica about the difference with the setup during the pandemic because there had been an adjustment all over the world because the COVID-19 pandemic is not just a health issue. It became an education issue because 
there had been transitions from face-to-face -face learning to online learning, where it's not only the teachers who were challenged, but also the students together with their parents. Here in the Philippines, in the first day of the online classes, the issue had been the internet connectivity because many people are using it It like has been there is a traffic while the use of the internet. And at the same time, of course, people are adjusting with the use of Zoom, Google Meet, MS Teams, or any other platforms. Not everybody has been well-versed immediately when they have said we have to transfer to online learning. And so the teachers have to learn. You could imagine yourself in the first day of classes or the first time you use Zoom, you were afraid if the students could hear you. You were afraid also if you could share the video, if they will be hearing the sound of the video clips that you were sharing, right? Before, we have to tell them, keep quiet in the face-to-face -face classroom. But right now, we tell them, unmute yourselves. You have to speak <laughs> up. So take a look at that. That's one concern. Another, for the younger kids, isn't it the parents have to be with them when they're having the sessions to ensure that they are attentive, that they are focused. And sometimes it's their parents who will be completing their homeworks or their assignments too because the students could not really focus. And what if the students do not know yet how to make use of this gadget as well as connection with the internet since they are young? And another problem with regards to the parents, what if they are not very knowledgeable on the use of this technology? Because whether we admit it or not, that's why some of the parents send their students in this school is because they want their children to achieve more than what they have achieved. What if these parents are not ready with the use of this? What if they do not know how to read? What if they do not know how to write? Then it would be very challenging for them. However, on that side, because of the pandemic, I have noticed that through the use of technology, the connectivity, the partnership, and linkages from all over the countries have flourished. Like in our university, there had been an expansion in the partnership since transactions were also conducted online. Before, when you have to meet people, you have to visit your countries, you have to talk with them physically. But right now, with the use of this technology, there had been a lot of online activities or internationalization activities in the forms of collaboration that had been done by different institutions. And that's one good way of helping each other open ourselves with different perspectives. And what I have learned from here is that humanity is always at hand. There are always people who would be there to help, to support, and to give us in any ways that they can. You could really see who your friends are and even kind-hearted people whom you do not know, but they are very willing to extend whatever they could give to you. And that really sounds very good because we have learned a lot, not only academically, but we learned so much being a person in this kind of situation. And right now, we're slowly going back to the normal, having face-to-face, -face, but of course, with still the consideration of you have to be careful because you might still contact the virus, but not as how afraid as how we were before. So thank you so much for that. Great. I think that was lovely to hear from you, Jonna. And uh, I think most of the points that you and Veronica said, I think all of us would actually, we resonate with that. And these exactly were the challenges. Great to hear and very, very happy to have you as one of the change makers uh, in the education industry. Great. Moving on next to Mr. Akmal Akroor from Uzbekistan. So Akmal, you are the head of new initiatives and trainings. What are the new initiatives and trainings? And I also understand you are the front runner on implementing technology. So over to you, Akmal. All right. Uh, so I'm not just like a front runner on implementing the technology, but uh, well, I'm the guy who helps the, the new projects to be implemented and uh, be run in our business. So generally, uh, my official status here is I'm actually the head of the uh, testing center in Uzbekistan. So we test the students uh, from all over the country, uh, or the English level. So we we provide a different level of um tests like the IELTS, TKT, language skills, and many other ones. And uh, apart from that, we realize that 
uh, if you want to provide some kind of let's say uh, uh, if you want to have our own uh, let's say place in this market we need to have have a, a, we had an idea that we need to bring something from we call it bumper to bumper where we say that we provide not only on, not only the education but we only provide the uh, the means how to get to the university how to get start, get the uh, scholarship from the other countries i mean uh, so we started from the school now we have a university we have we have a testing center, we have an educational center, and also we have a, now uh, we are planning to implement like a master's and doctorate as well in, in universities. And of course, all these kinds of things, all these projects cannot be implemented, cannot be successful unless you um, uh, use the technology, especially in our life. Everyone understand that uh, information is the key and access to the information, getting the uh, right information on time, being able to deliver your message, your service, it's all about the technology and that uh, you have to have some systems to make them all run together. So at the moment we are running about the few aspects. Uh, so at the moment, our biggest challenge, it's about the school and the university uh, because what happened is the private sector, private education sector is growing in our Uzbekistan and now we have a lot of competition so in order to be ahead of others in order to be successful in in, in this business you need to have a, something different and the, only the technology brings that differences because it connects the people it's bring the foreign teachers foreign expertise to Uzbekistan even not even traveling but also sharing by as we do now over the zoom for example and of course interaction between the students interaction between the parents and the university and school has changed a lot as well it's no longer that you gather the parents and have a speech about the every student it's about the let's say now we have a we want to use the application form where the parents have access as long as their student uh, their kids so they can see and track down the progress of the students they can see what they're learning actually how they're interacting with the uh, with the teacher so is that i mean uh, what needs to be improved so this kind of technologies make this communication is much easier and the, and especially when the parents see where the students, where the kids are actually going, in which direction, when they're going to reach the certain level, it's making them more comfortable about the choice they made because it's not easy to parents to choose which school or which university to send their kids, to be honest. So that's why for us, one of the most important things, it's about the communications uh, between the students and parents. And of course, when we talk about the communication, when we talk about the exchange of the information, we need to remember that the education itself has changed now. So even with interaction with the two, uh, tutors and the teachers, you, we are using technology at the moment because what's more important is exchanging them on time, getting the information on time, being able to deliver the message, deliver the study materials to the students on time. And having this technology on hand, it makes it much easier. And one of the good things is, for example, in terms of business, if you want to be ahead, for example, uh, you need to have, you need to, ex you need to have an expansion plan as well. So you need to have a few, not only one school, maybe a few other branches. And this, if you want to control the, all the branches, if you want to have a one standardized education system, when you want to keep the quality, that's the technology where it needs to be implemented. Otherwise you might fail while you're doing the new project. So I'm very, very happy to find out that there is a this kind of uh, application technologies like attachment, which can help us uh, in this term. So I'm very, very glad to see all of you and have opportunity to speak with you. Great. I think what you said absolutely resonated with one, each one of us. And I think with technology, we can actually maximize the potential of education. Thank you so much, Akmal. Yes. Let's move on to uh, Ms. Suhanti Kupuswami. Uh, Suhanti, you are the head of school at Wali International School, Malaysia. Over to you, Suhanti. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you on this wonderful platform. Um, it's, it's, it's a platform where we connect and uh, discuss about um, uh, how wonderful technology has actually improvised the art of living in this world at the moment, and especially post-COVID. Uh, I would say the evolution of technology has impacted every aspect of our lives from banking right up to education and the way we communicate to each other, yeah? In fact, technology has become an integral part 
of sustaining society and its infusion with education especially is therefore inevitable. Now, technology does not providing students with access to countless online resources, but also to us, major teachers and educators, which that's the only platform at the moment which we are getting them, you know, connected very easily. And I would say the objective of learning and teaching now has been met successfully with uh, a lot of students, especially post-COVID. Now, we, we had gone through COVID and uh, there was a lot of difficulties in Malaysia uh, when, you know, during the COVID session where I would say there's a lot of rural area where we did not even have internet connection, you know. And uh, as as we know, the government school with had international school is fine because they had the budget, but with the government education, government school, for them to reach out those students in the rural area, you know, and to establish that connection, internet connection, and to move on with the online education, it happened so fast, so rapidly, because we wanted, you know, the government wanted the students not to be left out of education. That's the most important thing. And I think that was the first step that the uh, government has taken uh, not to bridge and not to have any gap in that education. So within that few weeks, we could see how technology has evolved into uh, Google Meet was, you know, made easily uh, accessible. Zoom was made easily accessible. Uh, and a lot of other online platform uh, that we we didn't even think of and we do, we do not know. Most of us don't, you know, we have not heard about it. And that was made uh, very easily accessible to the educators and also the students. That's now, right. if you see why why is it important, you know, uh, especially during the COVID and post-COVID at the moment, students are often bombarded with information in the classroom which they must quickly attempt, you know, to process and make sense of. Now, however, this can leave them feeling overwhelmed and confused by the concepts, yeah? And uh, technology, I would say at the moment, provides the student with access to countless online resources and mm -hmm. encourage them to carry out their research and therefore they have become more independent in learning. That's what I would see from the students that you know i've i've seen i've seen them grow previously before covid and the same set of students which i'm seeing now at school they have become more independent in the learning process they could voice out you know and yeah. and they are more confident you know in the classroom and they are more lively and they are more uh, cheerful because they know the subject well, they know the content well, and how do they know it? It's not somebody else is teaching them at home because they have that online platform where they could explore the information, where they could explore and embrace themselves and, you know, and adapt themselves, improvise themselves to the knowledge prior to the uh, teaching happening in the classroom, which I would say that's, that's the wonderful effect of technology, uh, which has hugely impacted and uh, improvise the education industry, which all of us are very thankful. Um, though COVID is it's not something that you know we are looking for, but that has brought us into this level that I would say, yes. otherwise we wouldn't have you know, known uh, all this online platform and we wouldn't have taken the initiative to in fact um, uh, get this uh, out, you know, to, to, to embrace this uh, online platform and online uh, digital learning platform very quickly. Correct. We would very, very correct, it. said Suhanti. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, COVID has actually made all of us very, very tech savvy. Exactly. And uh, yes. those two teachers like you, uh, administrators like you, who have actually pushed it and they've been the force behind to ensure that your kids adopt the right technology. Excellent. Sure, exactly. Great to hear yes. that, Suhanti. Dr. June on the panelist with us. Uh, Dr. Junrail Zarko, you are the school director at EduLinks. You're also the book author, speaker, trainer, consultant at Philippines. Dr. June, over to you. Yes, I greet everyone. Good evening. And I'm happy to be in the company of wonderful people uh, tonight, uh, movers uh, of education at the same time, uh, thought leaders. I'm also... Uh, Delighted to uh, know that there's another Filipino in the meeting room. Uh, hi there. Okay, Ma'am Jonah, Carla. Nice meeting you virtually, Ma'am. Before the pandemic, I was the vice president for academics of the biggest uh, information technology school here in Cebu. And I was a school principal for 10 years. 
when the pandemic came, I bravely established a school. I know that many uh, schools were having apprehensions about their enrollment. Enrollment went down. Some uh, schools even here in the Philippines shut down during the pandemic. But my philosophy is always this. Every crisis brings with it vast opportunities and blessings. And it's up to us how to discover what these blessings and opportunities are. So I opened a school out of passion to help children in such a difficult time. I am in the, uh, I always have the heart for small uh, children, having been a school principal of an elementary uh, department here in the Philippines in a big university. And I think the much affected uh, sector of learners are those in the preschool or pre elementary uh, education, because, you know, many of them even, okay, are not that mature to face zoom to use the gadgets they're very dependent okay uh, to uh, their parents so i tried to uh, position my school as a non-traditional school uh, blending various approaches to include technology we try to customize our instruction. We know that some students are not that uh, physically and uh, mentally uh, ready uh, to uh, uh, join okay, the various online uh, classes. Their attention span is okay, short. So uh, we try to customize a program for each learner. So each learner then follows a distinct program called IAP or the Individualized Academic Program. And part actually in the delivery of this IAP is technology. And we're happy that we're able to connect okay, with uh, our parents, give them due feedbacks to the development of their children, do personalizing of our remediation and enrichment activities uh, through Messenger, okay, through uh, uh, Google Meet, Zoom, okay, and other platforms. The students later on were able to uh, make themselves very familiar with uh, Google Classroom, wherein they could access all those uh, resources there. So we're happy about the uh, development we are seeing among our students. They're embracing of technology also as part of the teaching and learning process. And now that the face-to-face -face classes have uh, resumed uh, here in the Philippines, we have decided as a school that we have to maintain technology. Technology has always to be there. We should not move backward because if we go back to face-to-face -face classes and then embrace all those traditional things that we did, uh, setting aside what we have learned during the pandemic, I think uh, we are in the wrong direction. So we have learned okay, that technology is an integral part of education and it should continue to be there and it has to move education forward. Dr. June, you absolutely hit the nail on the head. Absolutely. What you're saying is right. And it's it's so good to see that all the panelists over here, they have been early adopters of technology and they believe by leveraging technology, you can actually maximize the potential of education. Awesome. Great. Uh, I think uh, I'd like to introduce myself now. I'm Preeta. I'm the HR Director at Teach Prince Technologies, and I'm also the moderator of this talk show today, uh, but I'm not alone. I also have a co-host here, Ikanch. Over to you. Yeah, so I lead the international business at Teachment. I'm lovely, you know, fe feeling great to host this, uh, you know, with all of you as panels, uh, right, uh, with Preeta alongside. And we are here today to discuss the topic of leveraging technology to improve the learning outcomes, uh, right? And I think, uh, you know, the, our, our viewers here must be in agreement that this topic does not require a discussion per se, and, you know, just uh, invites the personal journeys and stories and learnings to let get started, right? So, yeah. Great. I think, Ikanch, you've been actually traveling a lot across the countries. If he's not in India, he's either in, you know, different parts of the globe. And very recently, we saw that he and his team were in Nigeria, and they came back really excited and upbeat. So, uh, Ikanch, why don't you share what was that all excitement all about? Over to you. Absolutely. I would, uh, you know, share the general observations that we could make, right? So, in the Nigeria market. So, currently, the larger cities such as Lagos, Port Harcourt, Abuja, uh, right? And I think uh, uh, Miss uh, Veronica would, you know, agree with me, uh, right? Have seen a larger adopt adoption of digitization where schools are now, you know, ready to adopt technology and have means and infrastructure to start adopting technology, right? And the passion 
uh, in the teachers is, you know, and the administration is more to focus, uh, you know, teachers, their teachers to focus on teaching and the learning outcomes rather than, you know, managing the day-to-day -day administration tasks, right? But the challenge that Nigeria faces today uh, and a larger, you know, sc uh, scalable challenge that it faces today is, uh, you know, with respect to the infrastructure, right, that exists in the country, uh, right, with uh, for access of equitable education, right, the right edu uh, the right infrastructure at scale would be required. So the policies such as, you know, the digital literacy policies of, you know, national policy in uh, ICT in education, uh, where, you know, they are running, where the government is running a lot of digital literacy program for teachers, admission, ad, uh, administrative staff, creating policies around having ICT personnel in every school, et cetera, are going to be very, very monu monumental in making sure that, you know, the education in Nigeria, uh, you know, is delivered at a quality level. Uh, in fact, uh, one such unique initiative that I heard was the National Broadband Program of 2020 to 2025, right? So those initiatives, right, as they materialize would really create a larger change, right? And that is what we are looking forward to. Uh, one of the highest uh, growing economies in terms of uh, the population growth rate as well in the age group of five to 18, right? It is poised well, you know, for uh, having education reforms, right? At this point in time. Great. And I think uh, uh, Ikansh uh, and I think Veronica, we were all discussing uh, in our previous conversations that the Nigerian government last year, they also announced that they they are planning to increase the annual expenditure on education by 50% over next two years. What an awesome time to be there. And Veronica, would you like to add, how does it feel to be in such a in such great times? You have plethora of opportunities. Uh, you know, you, you can make a difference. I'm so excited. Since that announcement, everybody has more like yeah. been getting our notepads, we're planning how much we want, what we want, teacher training, children that, you know, because it's so refreshing for us to finally have a voice. COVID played a major role in that, I must say, because it was like one day when school and the next day is shut down. We have millions of children at home, families crying out because the kids are like marking time. So it's really good. We're excited. We're excited. We're excited about this, and we know that it's going to change so many things in Nigeria. Awesome. All the very best yeah. to you, Veronica. You're at the right time, yeah. and with your passion and energy, I'm sure <laughs> you'll be rocking your way through. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Great. Uh, uh, I would also like to share, Veronica, you just mentioned about COVID. And I think with COVID, I'd like to talk about Philippines, because Philippines as an as a country, uh, while rest of the uh, schools in the rest of the globe, they were on an average close to for about 79 to 80 days on an average as per one of the reports. It was found that in Philippines, the schools were closed for over one year. So we had two kinds of reports. One was talking about loss of uh, learning outcomes in children, uh, mental distress. On the other side, how fast, you know, uh, the entire COVID propelled uh, the adoption of technology. Uh, in that sense, uh, Ikanj, you also happen to travel around that time and, uh, you know, uh, get in touch with a lot of people. What's your sense on that market? Absolutely. I'll, I'll take a slight step back and, you know, share uh, for this forum, uh, right, a bit of background of education uh, uh, systems in Philippines, right? So uh, just to share, right, Philippines is one of the youngest countries uh, to have K-12 reforms as late as 2012. Uh, right, and was the only country in Asia to have that kind of a reform uh, this late. But uh, given the disparity in the economic landscape of, uh, uh, with different islands across different islands in the Philippines, right, from 2012 to now in 2023, when I visit uh, Philippines, right, I see how uh, the government is uh, creating avenues to, you know, support quality education by educating, by encouraging private schooling systems. Uh, there are subsidies for every student enrolled in a private school. There are digitization initiatives, even in the government school systems, uh, right? The digitization initiatives are, uh, you know, being done in a big way. And I think right now it is one of the few countries where the central body, DEPED, uh, right, is taking a big leap in, you know, deciding the entire curriculum, uh, revisiting it again and again, uh, right, to make sure that they, it is, uh, you know, to the requ required standards of today. And I think it's only one of the uh, countries which has sort of, you know, mandated to Mr. What, what Mr. Dr. June was also, you know, pointing out too, that you should uh, 
have at least two out of five days of school uh, where you know digital education or education is imparted digitally uh, right and uh, that's something really really uh, fascinating to see and i'm sure with this kind of an ecosystem uh, right and meeting those uh, school administrators or ground uh, i could see why and how they are excited about you know bringing uh, digital tools uh, to their education institutions so pretty excited about education market in philippines and you know uh, the reformations that are happening there uh, yes so great so on this note uh, jona and dr june would you like to you know share your thoughts about it well uh, me first okay perhaps then miss jona okay next uh, well uh, it can see uh, correct that uh, here in the philippines uh, we are one okay of the youngest among asean countries uh, who are to do okay innovation uh in a uh, basic education uh reform uh the k to 12 i think uh, that uh, took off in uh 2012 with the addition of two more years okay in the senior high school well uh there were struggles when we uh, implemented the k to 12 for the very uh, first uh, three years <clears throat> but we are also happy that uh, with the constant evaluation activities that the government that the private sector okay has done uh, there were uh, immediate uh, addressing of those uh, concerns that uh, we had uh, seen and uh, when kate uh, when the pandemic okay came yes uh, we are one of those countries also with the longest uh, suspension of uh, classes uh, i think uh, clo uh, schools are closed for around uh, 2 years but uh, we also understand okay, the government, uh, knowing that uh, we are a country with a 100 million uh, population of people. Uh, we don't want that uh, schools will be opened immediately without careful evaluation on how safe uh, the environment is if uh, COVID is uh, not to infect okay, the children anymore, the vaccination and the others. There were so many considerations. But uh, despite the closure, yes, there was a of learning, but I think we see it as a blessing also because it gives us enough time uh, to uh, really uh, collaborate both the public and the private sector on how to uh, orchestrate the reopening of classes. Uh, we started okay with like few days uh, uh, face to face, then eventually later on full uh, face to face. Uh, there were uh, activities that the different uh, schools have implemented to address uh, loss of learning remedial program. In fact, when uh, just this school year, there was the administration of the uh, national achievement test for the grade twelve. That is to uh, officially uh, check uh, the effect okay, of the uh, pandemic when it comes to the learning of the students. And, and we are expecting interventions from uh, the government as soon as these results okay, have been uh, collated, analyzed, and interpreted. Great. So all the very best to you, Dr. June, on that. And uh, just to add to our uh, viewers and to our speakers, Dr. June is also responsible for accrediting schools across the country. All the very best to you, Dr. June, on that. Moving on to Jonna. Jonna, you did mention that due to COVID, you shared your experiences. But I would like to understand from you as a person, as a professor, as a teacher, uh, what was the what you know what were the extra steps you had to take to bridge that gap? As a person, I really value education. Even you are the professor or the teacher. One of the most important things is to set yourself as an example to your students, despite of the challenges. It's one good thing that during the pandemic, I was able to complete my PhD. But the, before the pandemic, I was attending the classes face to face. But during that time, despite the challenges, I was able to do it. And that's one thing that I really take pride of because it wasn't that easy during that time, considering distance. Uh considering uh, uh, the situation and also considering the set of circumstances that every individual is facing. Another thing is that I have also learned the value of helping one another. In our country, it was very popular that we have the bayanihan. It means helping each other, particularly in the time of the need. There had been community pantries that have been developed in different places, particularly in the university where I am working, where in the employees donated not only money, but also food, 
which are being distributed to people who are in need. And at the same time, there had been an education on wheels that had been devised by our university. As part of the initiative of our university president, there had been buses equipped with internet. There had been some laptops inside and some books. And it is being traveled to far-flung places so that it could reach the students who do not have good access to technology. We also send professors in there so that within that place, they could provide a good education to the students. And it's one way which I think would be very essential. Another is that uh, Ekach had mentioned a while ago that the Philippines is really doing its best to support the people, the students. In the university, it's a state university. It doesn't charge any fees to the senior high school, to the high school students, and even the undergraduate students for tuition fees. It's free of tuition fee. Even the entrance examination, they do not pay for it. It's being funded by the government. So that's one good way of providing a quality education to the students. Because I'm also proud to say that in most of the programs, there are top notchers arising from our university. So we could really say that it's still providing quality education despite the fact that the students are being funded by the government. And that's one good initiative which the government is really trying to do in order to provide for the students. Actually, on the start of the online classes, there had been also two choices for the students. One is the correspondence or the modular, and the other one is the online learning. For those who could not afford to have those gadgets and internet connectivity, what the university did is um, they sent the modules to the students. We tied up with couriers, and those couriers are the ones responsible for sending the modules that the students will be using. And afterwards, the students who will be answering it, it will be sent back to the university through the career partner that we had. So that's another initiative that we have done. Great. I think that was lovely to hear. Uh, and I think uh, personally, thank you very much for leading by example. Uh, I think one teacher can make a difference to a lot of lives. Thank you so much. And on this note, uh, let's touch base with Malaysian government uh, uh, why Malaysia? And I, when I say Malaysian, I can see Kansha smiling because anytime we have a long weekend, you'll not find Ikansha in India and he just lands up in Malaysia. So Ikansha, what is this, uh, you know, uh, all that excitement about Malaysia from your side? I think so. Uh, Malaysia is a very interesting uh, country, right? Uh, uh, I think Malaysia is made up of 33% of Indians who, uh, you know, move uh, to Malaysia uh, sometime. <laughs> Uh, right, so it's a pretty uh, uh, close country, uh, right, to my heart. And uh, I, I would, uh, again, uh, you know, I've been doing this. Uh, I take back and, you know, give a slight perspective of how the education reforms have happened, right, and what kind of unique challenges that the education system has gone through uh, in every country, right? Uh, so uh, Malaysia, as we all know, right, is one of the, uh, has been one of the magnets for MNCs in the late 90s, right, uh, and became uh, almost formidable, uh, right, in uh, uh, in the SEA uh, region altogether, uh, and also saw a lot of international universities coming in and attracting a lot of student talent uh, back in the 90s itself, right, in the early 2000s, uh, right. Uh, although the Malaysia K-12 education system has seen massive reforms, right, where uh, the primary subject, uh, the primary language of uh, teaching when it changed from uh, English to Malay, right, it led to a lot of uh, you know, changes and the generational shift that the teachers, the publishers, the entire education engine uh, had to go through, uh, right? But it also led to one important thing, right? A demand for a private schooling infrastructure and which saw real growth, uh, right? Uh, during the 2012 to uh, 18 period, right? And uh, these private schools also brought a lot of digital adoption, uh, right? With them, uh, right? And which then also the government started to focus on and started to build on. Currently, knowing that the government has invested into uh, MDEC, uh, which is, you know, focusing on digitization and, uh, you know, the larger educational reforms that are of the need of today, right, that puts Malaysia on a hot spot, uh, right, uh, of the next five-year roadmap, wherein we would, we would see a major adoption of technology 
in education in education and the k12 uh, you know segment in malaysia and i think uh, uh, suhanti uh, would be able to share more with us on the very same thing but i i'm i'm very excited about malaysia as i look at it as a country right and how uh, you know the progress will happen from now on yes great so with that i think suhanti uh, you are you are already mentioned that there is a lot of good work you are doing and you're excited about so many more interventions which have been rolled out all the very best to you suhanti on that well i'm surprised to hear that uh, akash and uh, yes it's very true i would say that uh, the education system now has been uh, going towards but i i would just make some addition that uh, yes they the robust was uh, they changed it back to uh, bahasa malay but again now the government has changed it back you know maths and science into english that's right so just maths and science and they have got this dlp classes dual language program classes in every year level from i would say year 1 right up to secondary so that that is you know uh, for them to cater for international school students and those students who are uh, shifting back to malaysia from abroad and uh, you know post covid there's a lot of uh, families who were abroad and you know just came by Uh, i would say those days uh, two or three years back we might have about uh, one dlp classes in at school and now they are having at least two to three just to cater for that and uh, english and mathematics are being taught in english at the moment uh, sorry uh, maths and uh, science is being taught in english so that's that's one uh, thing that you know that has been improved and i would say that uh, a lot of uh, government school children you know are, are very happy about that parents are very happy that's uh, uh, one innovative that malaysia government has done and uh, yes the technology embrace i would say uh, at the moment in k12 education in malaysia it is growing very rapidly that's a lot of platform online platform digitalized platform uh, which is being introduced in school are uh, not just private and international school but all, also uh, government school where the kids you know they get their own logins where they could do research they can get connected to teachers they no longer wait for the teacher to come back the next day to get connected or you know for problem solving and they have always had this personal <laughs> yeah exactly so they have got that personal attachment where they can you know click on you know uh, they they can go online and 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 send a private message to to specific uh, teachers and uh, there's no worry if group members not there to complete the work and you know uh, hand over and you know for them to catch up if they are absent for that because there's always online platform and they get connected after school hours more than we teachers do great you know? i think uh, yes. i think technology is playing an awesome role here in making the exactly. entire experience very very seamless thank you so much suhanti on that and lovely to hear and wishing you all the very best thank you thank you very much great and i uh, as ikanch and i we were discussing once you know the whole idea of education is not about imparting just knowledge and skills but it's about teaching children how to think better and that's where when we talk about vocational trainings entrepreneurial education is important and on this note i like to quickly ask ikanch you in uzbekistan i think you've been looking at that and you're looking at that market what's your view point on that so uzbekistan um, uh, right has been a, a very uh, you know new discovery for us uh, right and has been something which has uh, made us very very interested uh, right in that uh, so uh, uzbekistan is one of the countries which has actually Uh, an education index of 0.92 right so it's one of the uh, highly developed countries uh, right uh, but is also a country wherein due to certain uh, reasons right the private schooling was prohibited altogether right and uh, the country saw its first british school of tashkent in the year 2010 uh, right and that was to basically open up right opportunities for children to learn in a more secure and a stimulating environment as you were mentioning Uh, right where people uh, really change the way students think uh, right and uh, the children of all uh, you know nationalities uh, were uh, you know exposed to the english national curriculum uh, from that particular event right and today uh, right in 2020 uh, there are larger universities such as steam university that have opened up right so uh, there has been one major shift uh, right where private education is something which is being encouraged as well uh, right which brings in a lot of freedom uh, in the way you know the education is imparted right and our students are uh, let open uh, you know to think uh, right and i think uh, mr uh, uh, akmal here with us right uh, would be super excited to share uh, because i think he has seen that journey uh, right all throughout uh, right and is actually a leading example of leading that journey as well in the country 
So more with us and how technology is actually helping Mr. Rakmal to, you know, uh, take that uh, initiative to, you know, a second level. Akmal, over to you yeah. on this note. Okay, uh, thank you very much once again. Yes, it's true. Uh, when it comes to the private education, our country is quite, uh, quite new for this experience. Beforehand, it was only public education. It was only the state university and school control and owned by the com uh, by the government but now for the last five six years it has changed a lot so we have now got the too many foreign university opens in uzbekistan their branches uh, we have a uh, uh, entrepreneurs who are interested in opening their own like for example universities who make the, to prepare the their own employees for their business to be honest today i just met the one of the uh, with the one uh, big uh, factory and they are planning to open the uh, institute of the uh, to create the uh, engineers for themselves for example it's a good shift it's a great shift and uh, another thing is uh, what makes uh, at, the, at the moment what makes a difference uh, is we used to have a russian education system uh, because we used to be the part of the ussr for so many years and uh, most of the education system was based on the Russian USSR system and uh, actually the Russian was the second language for in most for many years but now uh, for the past uh, 10 years it has changed now and the English becoming more popular over the Russians Russian is still uh, popular the people are still getting good educations on Russia but the English become a number one at the moment among the foreign uh, foreign languages and of course uh, being exposed to the world being exposed to the new knowledge and the new educational system, educational materials and everything, that the only things that can actually helping us at the moment, it's actually the technology. Uh, because as you said, it's not easy. For example, uh, everyone is talking about the COVID. So COVID was like a breaking point for everyone to realize that something needs to be done differently. Uh, before that, we were just on the, uh, let's say, easy mode but after the COVID I think we realized that we need to do something differently and the only the technology no, that brings the, <laughs> yes yeah it's just to bring the uh, changes and actually the technology is actually they created a new opportunity for us at the moment for example I'll give you example as how it is uh, uh, now we have examiners we have a teachers we have a lectures who is actually can teach and give their experience while being on their own country, not just traveling to our country. Of course, the face-to-face -face is still preferable, but it's not easy to travel from one country to another one and uh, to change your life so drastically, but being in your home, being in your home country and being able to expose to the different culture, to the different people, it's uh, something that makes the differences. So technology is the great things. And uh, making the point about technology, I know that the, you all have experience, but what I have learned from my own observation during the COVID that despite the fact that the technology is everywhere around us, that we are actually exposed to the technology, but when it comes to the certain areas like education, I realized that we're not so ready for that, that the people, the students, teachers, uh, not they're not really ready to be the technology to implement in their life, to be honest. That was strange because we realized that the, some of the parents and teachers, they don't know how to use the, some of the applications. They don't know how to get access to the online platform. They, we realize that the majority doesn't know what does mean, get the, what's the difference between online education and offline education, literally. What's the beneficial of the online education or how you can use the technology to make a difference. So, so now we have a challenge uh, from in our hand. It's not just to implement the technology to our education system, but also bring the people to the level where they can they acquaint that they're easy to use this technology and I hope that the, I can see that the technology, I mean, the, you know, everything is changing and make it the process easier. But still, I mean, the one of the major ch challenge, I believe, so it's not only just the implementation, it's also bringing the people be able to use this technology easily. Absolutely. I think, Akmal, you are just saying the right thing. It's just not getting to the right technology, but adoption is the need of the hour. So you have to actually identify the right technology and adopt it well. As I said, you are the change makers from the education industry. We wish you all the very best and thank you so much for your time and invaluable insights that you've shared today. 
Uh, as we also discussed today that across the globe, businesses are evolving constantly, policies are changing, macro and microeconomic factors are forcing us to look at our processes and bring in efficiencies. It is also making it imperative for educators across the globe to look at how they are teaching, the teaching methodologies, the pedagogy, to bring in efficiencies and to ensure they leverage technology the right way so that they free up their bandwidth from doing routine and operational tasks and they can put focus on giving life skills and critical thinking skills to the kids so that they become future ready and they can think through the unknown. With this, thank you very much. Ekanch, would you like to add? No, absolutely. I think uh, second that last thought that, you know, uh, it, it's really, really impa imperative for educationists across the globe to adopt the newer methods of technology and, you know, leverage the right technology, what Mr. Rachman mentioned in his last, you know, uh, time that uh, more we are adopting these tools, we are also realizing a bigger challenge is to make sure that we adopt the right tool, uh, right, uh, which we can actually start to use, right, and make these things happen. So I think uh, uh, really, really nice uh, speaking with you, all of you here, right? Having these amazing panelists here and sharing and discussing these thoughts. Uh, super excited, uh, inspired, right? And I'm pretty sure that every one of us here agree that leveraging technology is a sure shot way to the future proof, uh, you know, ourselves uh, towards the education challenges that are ahead to come, right? And solve for them and provide the best for our, uh, you know, uh, younger generations and students out there. All right, so with this, thank you so much to all our esteemed panelists and all our viewers. Thank you very much for your time.